this week on the Back Table Podcast. It's a basic necessity of a medical proceduralist in the United States to have hospital privileges. It's just a given. It's where bigger procedures are done, consults are made, relationships are made. Some specialists do a lot more of their procedures in an office or an ASC, but they still have hospital privileges. Some folks may say, well, why don't you just go and open up an OBL and leave us alone at the hospital? Some radiology groups may say that. And the problem with that is, is that many states, in order to have an office suite like Florida, you have to have hospital privileges in your specialty with being credentialed to do those procedures you do in your office, or you have to have transfer agreement. Transfer agreements are generally not given unless you're on staff. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on Backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. BD provides clinical education and training through the BD Peripheral Intervention Advanced Healthcare Providers courses. The BD Advanced team offers programs on advanced endovascular management of AV access, emerging techniques in the management of CLTI and venous disease, as well as many different resident programs and peer-to-peer opportunities. Contact your local BD representatives to learn more or visit the BD Advance webpage. This discussion is supported by Siemens Health and Years. Venturing into outpatient care with clinical, business, and financial decisions to consider, it may feel like you're exploring new territory and the stakes are high for you, your patients, and your practice. Now imagine you have an experienced partner to help you create a successful, sustainable practice. Feels like a relief, doesn't it? Siemens Health and Years is here to empower you in every care setting, every step of the way. Visit siemens-healthandyears.us to discover how healthcare providers leverage the specific expertise, products, and services from Siemens Health and Years to meet their unique outpatient care goals. Now, back to the episode. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Behetti, coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. I have the pleasure of welcoming back a speaker on the episode today, Dr. Bill Julian. He's a vascular interventional physician at South Florida Vascular Associates. And our topic today stems from our last episode that we did with him regarding getting on staff as an independent IR at a hospital. Dr. Julian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ali. It's great to be back. So when you first told me that some people inquire, I made reference to a talk I had given a few years back at the SIR annual meeting, and apparently some of the listeners tried to find that talk and couldn't. I gave a talk in March 2018 in Los Angeles at the SIR annual meeting, and it was entitled Roadmap for Obtaining Independent IR Hospital Privileges. So when you asked if I wanted to do a podcast, I was sort of conflicted, and the, the reason I was conflicted is it's kind of a silly, embarrassing talk to have to give. And the reason is there is no other specialty in the United States that has to talk about how to getting hospital privileges. Basically, any procedural specialist walks through the door, they are allowed to get privileges. And so it's this odd generation long problem where the radiologists use their so-called exclusive contract, which I would call a pseudo exclusive contract to block the independent IRs. And so any other specialty hearing this would not even understand it. But initially, I didn't really want to do it. But then I thought, well, you know what, if I if I help maybe a handful of people, then it's probably worth doing. And so I decided this is good for us to go ahead and do it. Absolutely. Yeah, there was a lot of interest after that episode about just figuring out how to go about it, really the algorithm or the logistics of how to do it especially as more and more hospital systems get consolidated and radiology groups tend to have contracts for larger health systems. So let's just start with a basic question. Why is it important for an IR doctor to have hospital privileges? Well, really, it's a basic necessity of a medical proceduralist in the United States to have hospital privileges. It's just a given. It's where bigger procedures are done, consults are made, relationships are made. Some specialists do a lot more of their procedures in an office or an ASC, but they still have hospital privileges. Some folks may say, well, why don't you just go and open up an OBL and leave us alone at the hospital? Some radiology groups may say that. And the problem with that is, is that many states, 
in order to have an office suite like Florida, you have to have hospital privileges in your specialty with being credentialed to do those procedures you do in your office, or you have to have transfer agreement. Transfer agreements are generally not given unless you're on staff. And so it's critical for that reason to have it. And in other states, even if you can have an OBL without hospital privileges, there are a lot of other issues. Like in, in your state, Washington, a lot of the um, insurance companies won't credential you on their plans. They won't contract with you if you don't have hospital privileges. So it's really uh, the ramifications are, are quite dramatic, not being able to get hospital privileges. And of course, it wouldn't make sense for this being the only procedural specialty in the United States that can't just routinely get these in walking through, just walking through the door like everyone else. Now, you may ask, why do you care? Because as I once told you, I'm closer to the end of my career than the beginning, and I am on staff at five hospitals. But I guess there's something baked into my DNA along with my friend Jerry Niezwiecki. I never asked him why he's so passionate about the topic, but it just always seems so incredibly unfair to me that when I started, untrained surgeons were doing cases at any hospital they wanted, and I couldn't get privileges there. So it was just infuriating to me. And I, if I can help a new generation of young IRs, then I'd like to do that. Yes. You strike me as somebody who uh, believes strongly in justice. And I, I like that about you. That's an awesome trait. Well, tell me a little bit about your story back in 2001 of how you ended up getting on staff at a hospital. So I finished my fellowship at the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute in 92. And I told you last time that I was supposed to go to Seattle, but instead that fell through for reasons I mentioned before. And I ended up falling in a practice that was starting out brand new. There was a couple of senior guys who decided to start a radiology group, but they didn't have an IR. And so I came in as the IR. We were able to get a contract. And before too long, there was three hospitals. And so we were we were rolling along pretty well, but there were storm clouds. It was very clear that IR and DR didn't have a lot in common. In fact, myself and the senior partner both agreed that we actually tried to split it off, but the administration didn't really like that novel concept. And then towards 1999, about eight years into when I was in the practice, the senior gentleman wanted to sell to a company. That group ultimately became what was now known as Envision. You can you know how they what happened to them. So I didn't want to sell, and I didn't even like being in a radiology group because I, you couldn't have an office and see patients in the traditional way. And I knew that just was not how I wanted to practice, and it's not how you get the patients. So I I did a couple things. First, I tried to get on staff at the North Broward Hospital District, which is a four hospital system. They had a program called the Heart Center of Excellence, but there was nothing vascular related to it. And at the time, that's when the uh, vascular centers of excellence were becoming sexy. A lot of it based on what Barry Katzen had done down at, in Miami. And I negotiated with them to become the director of the vascular portion of, of the newly named Heart and Vascular Center of Excellence. And it was approved by the board. Well, what happened was the radiology group there, they got wind of it. And I got legal letters saying they'd love for me to join their group. But if I tried to get on staff, they were going to file legal action. And the North Broward Hospital District had a lot of problems over the years. They've had DOJ investigations and fines, and they've had suicides by the CEO, and they've been graft, and there's been different issues. And they had enough going on that they decided to back out of the offer. And so what's interesting to, is that 20 years later, whatever it is, they still don't, they haven't, it's not like they're Nova Vascular. By blocking me, it didn't make North Broward any better, and it didn't help out that group at all. Their paying patients still don't go there. It's still the same low-level place it was. So I had to find another opportunity, and I looked at a hospital outside my restrictive covenant, a little bit north of where I had been on staff. These were sort of the features. They had a weak group. They didn't even have a functioning angio suite. This group had two hospitals. So in the rare case when there was an angio case, they would transfer it to their other hospital when it would get done. And it was close enough to my old hospital that people knew me. I had a big following and I had so I, people went to bat for me that said they wanted me there. And probably real importantly was it wasn't the typical old boys network hospital. There was a woman CEO. She's very aggressive. All she cared about was money, getting patients through the door. And she was pretty ferocious. And so she went to bat for me and it was touch and go for a while. I was actually about seven months since I left my old group to the time I opened my new practice. So I didn't really know if we were going to be able to pull it off. 
So that was September 2001. And one thing that's interesting is I did offer to take call, but I insisted on anyone who gets credentialed for endovascular that had to take call. So ultimately, the vascular surgeons took call. We did this for about 10 years, and then they disbanded the call because you really wouldn't get called on call. It would be it would go to the individual practitioners. But I was certainly willing to do that, and I, and I did offer that. Now, were you involved in any diagnostic radiology call or IR call, or was it all just endovascular call? No, it was my own private practice, nothing to do. The only time I would go to radiology is if I ordered a study and I wanted to look at it. I might, but I had no interaction. I tried to be collegial. They would get some vascular studies. I, I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. And of course, they weren't doing anything. So well, other than them being hurt emotionally, it didn't really affect it. All it did was help their imaging business, but nothing to do with the radiology group, much like a vascular surgeon would be practicing there. Now, one thing that people may be interested in is I opened it up to everybody, but the four radiology groups came and went, and it, each one that would subsequently come would try to close the contract and block me and get me kicked off staff. And so I had to do some politicking because I knew this would happen, and there were tricks that went on by some of the new groups trying to get me kicked off staff, but I had my supporters, and so they didn't kick me off staff, and they were going to try to play games like, okay, Bill Julian's grandfathered in, but no one else, which means I could never hire anybody. So I had to know that preemptively and tell them Bill Julian's group should be allowed to have people in. So there have been people after me who've tried to get on staff that have struggled. And you may be, well, if I got on staff, why can't they? And it's because the radiology groups closed it. And so I'll probably come back to that because there are some other IRs on staff that I, I've helped get on. So you mentioned that there were delays and a couple failures before you were on staff. Anything else you'd like to say about that topic? No, but it is stressful that you have to make a living and not, you know, most folks don't worry about this. They just walk to the door and start working. And so it is an, it is an unfair practice that's present that I think our national society could help a lot in getting rid of this problem. So you mentioned you got, that was your first hospital that you got on staff for, but you're on five total. So tell me about how you got on staff at the other ones. So one of them was one of my original, two of my original hospitals. So since I was already on staff there, and since that was the practice that I had left and I had already changed the mentality of IR should be separate, they were more open to having me come back on staff after my restrictive covenant was over. And there was already another guy who had joined because of the setup. And so that wasn't that hard. One of those hospitals closed and a brand new hospital opened and I just got moved over. And then two hospitals up north, I had to do some politicking. But once again, that group that was there, they had no office, they don't see patients, they just service the folks in the hospital and the vascular surgeons were doing a lot. So the hospital CEO saw it as a positive thing to have a quality doctor on staff who would potentially do cases there. Now, I am on staff at five hospitals, but I don't go very often anymore because I do 99% of my work in my office where I have my OBL. And I go to the hospital mostly these days for its for triple A's. Used to be once a month, now it's maybe once every couple months. I have a good relationship with the vascular surgeon there. You know, we have good camaraderie. And so, you know, that's worked out well. In fact, if I have someone that I know needs to go to the hospital, I can actually rely on some of those folks to give me a hand if I'm tied up in the office, which I usually am. I see. Yeah. No, you, you keep a very busy practice in your OBL. Let's go through your roadmap for how physicians can get on staff and starting with the easiest pathway that you laid out for us. Okay, so I, over the years, learned from a lot of folks what they've done. And so I'm just going to kind of run through all the different examples that I know. Maybe this will, a light bulb may go off in some of the people listening. So you should always look, I'll say right now, I'm not a lawyer. You probably have a healthcare attorney, but these are my ideas based on successes I've seen out there. So the easiest one is to go to an open staff. You don't want to get in a big legal battle. Most of the people who are trying to get on staff, these are individual IRs who don't have the financial wherewithal and the time to fight these battles. This is a silly question, but how do you figure out if a hospital has an open staff policy or not? You could just apply through the medical staff office. What usually happens in most hospitals is they'll just say, 
we have an exclusive radiology contract and we're not, they're not going to give you a pre-application because they give you a pre-application, which is just like a one page, what your specialty is, what you're applying for. And occasionally you might slip through the door because they might think you're a vascular surgeon because sometimes people call me a vascular surgeon and maybe they told them I was. And it, it can actually go along a little bit before they realize who you are and that there may be a potential problem. And you'll also know from the community, usually. It may be someone who, maybe the radiology group doesn't have a contract and they're just working month to month, or maybe they traditionally have not had one. And so you may be more open, but usually you'll get a sense. So, but you have to apply to the medical staff office. Now, one of my friends did many years ago, their group sold to some entity. It didn't work out. And then they bought the entity back. And during that period, there was a period of time where there was no contract in place. And so time came to sign the new contract, the group's contract, which would have had their restrictive covenants and termination clause and their exclusivity to the group. And he says, you know what? I don't want to do it. I just want to be an independent IR. So this battle royale erupted and he was in a many, many year lawsuit. He ultimately spent close to 300 grand. And ultimately there was a settlement where he was allowed to stay on staff they paid the legal fees, but he was unable to bring anybody new on. So once again, my poor friend is unable to bring people on. In fact, a funny story, not really funny, but he hired a cardiologist in an IR and the cardiologist, not nearly as well trained, was able to do procedures in the hospital, but the IR was never able to get hospital privileges. So it kind of just shows you how unfair it is the current situation. Now, another very helpful way to get on staff, and this is actually more common now since there's a shortage of IR, is to look to groups who need coverage, call coverage, for instance. If you have a certain skill set, maybe you could say, I'd like to be on staff so you can call me on whatever tips. Maybe their guys don't, maybe their folks don't do tips, or it's just call coverage every fourth week, for instance, and then you might be able to get on staff. Now, usually you're subcontracting with the radiology group, and that's a bit of a problem because every other specialty has independent privileges unrelated to any contractual relationship. So hospital-based groups like radiology, anesthesia, ER, pathology, they are contract doctors and they can be terminated at any time. And there's what's called a clean sweep clause, which means they're gone and the new group comes in. That's quite a bit different than any other specialty in the hospital who like myself, being an independent IR, I told you four groups came and went, didn't affect me at all. You don't want to be swept out because your agreement to be on staff is underneath them. So they may hire someone and say, we no longer need your services, so we're going to you know, terminate you. Or it could be a new group that comes in. Either way, you're out of your privileges. And in the case of if you have an OBL that's relying on those privileges, you're in deep doo-doo that that could happen. Why would it be beneficial for a DR group um, to let you be a subcontractor? Can we just go through those reasons? Because they don't have coverage. Maybe they're having trouble covering IR. Maybe someone retires. Maybe they just can't get people, but people get burned out. So let's say they have two IRs and they only want to be on call every third. Maybe they're saying, I'm out of here if we can't get more coverage. And I know Ali, she'll come and she'll do every third week for us. And so... I think they'll be desperate. And I think it's going to happen more often with uh, what's happened with radiology groups and private equity and how miserable a lot of the IRs are in these groups. I do have a little story I could share with you. I think it always helps to have real life stories of what people are dealing with out there. So about maybe, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, maybe a little more, I can't remember. There was a young IR in a radiology group in the Northeast who was miserable because he couldn't do the clinical work he wanted and he, he left. And he ended up legally going outside his restrictive covenant and joined a successful vascular surgery practice. And they were on staff at a number of hospitals. And so he applied to, for privileges in those hospitals to do the exact same procedures his vascular surgery partners were doing. And he got denied at every hospital. And it turns out that the head of the department there is an academic guy at an academic institution who has private practice contracts as well. And he basically told him, I don't really get anything out of this. We're not going to let you come on staff. And so Jerry Niedzwiecki and I talked to this doctor, who's a past president of the society and a gold medalist of our SIR society. And he basically said that he knows it's wrong for IR, 
perhaps it's illegal, but he's going to do it as long as he can because he has to pay the IR salaries and he's going to use whatever potential help he can get to maintain their, their practice. So if you have leaders of the society who feel this way and these other, some of these other examples I'll share, you can just see how hard it is to change things out there. And it's really a struggle that the young folks coming out of training should not have to face. And so that would be why I would say the SAR really needs to step up and, and change things. For more than a decade, Reflow Medical has designed and engineered medical devices that respond to unmet clinical needs. The Wingman Crossing Catheter with its unique extendable beveled tip and an expanded indication for CTOs. The Specs LP, created to meet the need for a low profile version of the Specs shapeable support catheter and the new line of core catheters that answers the call for a suite of effective tools to use in challenging PCI procedures. Are there any other ways that IR doctors can get hospital privileges that you've seen in your experience? It's not hard to look around town and find out who the oddballs are, who the people are who are not in radiology groups. So probably almost the first day you're in town, you'll figure that out. And so you can inquire you can either talk to them or you could apply to the hospitals you know they're on staff. Now, understand, in a normal situation, you'd be able to get on staff. But like I mentioned before, a lot of times, even though I've opened up some places, they get closed down when a new group comes in. So just because I'm on staff or somebody other than the IR is on staff doesn't mean you're going to get on staff. But that certainly is a good place to look. I think the last resort would be to litigate, to file a lawsuit. It's just too expensive and time consuming and stressful. If you were part of a big entity that you had a lot of office suites in different states, then for sure, I think you should fight it. And I think there's a good chance you would win because the whole concept of a exclusive contract that blocks no one except for one group and allows everybody else to practice is, I think you have a good argument that there's nothing exclusive about it. What are some of the counter arguments you've heard from combined IR DR groups as to why independent IR doctors should not have hospital privileges? They'll say things like they won't take call, even though that's usually not the case. They'll make up any possible excuses they can. They'll say they need the room. They don't want any competition for the room. But of course, every hospital has operating rooms that are shared by everybody. It can all be worked out. Cath labs are shared by folks. So they'll say no call, there's no room, we have to be able to get our work done, they're going to take our cases. Which in essence, I mean, you probably are going to take some of the cases, right? No, I. so what I would say to them is, what you asked me this last time, and I'll restate your question, which is, what does the radiology groups get out of letting you on staff? And I would say they get imaging studies, Imagine what your vascular surgeon does. They might order CTAs and vascular studies. They might bring an expertise to some procedure that your group doesn't have, like I'll just say whatever tips or chemo, embo or something. Now, of course, there's going to be those out there in fancy groups who say we do everything and we don't need you. But in most cases, I would say who really cares about those groups? They made their bed. Their bed is this silly exclusive, pseudo exclusive contract, which guarantees them none of the good cases. And they're now in large part, mostly done by other specialists, but it requires them contractually to do all the things that nobody else wants to do. They've effectively created a model. So they are the trash collectors of the hospital in a lot of places. Ah, the trash collector word. Okay, so that has gotten a lot of flack recently. I don't know if you've seen on social media that calling, you know, a lot of the general IR procedures that are done, calling them trash procedures. I think it's worth talking about for a second with you because I don't think people say that word like trash IR disrespectfully necessarily. And I don't think it's disrespectful to the procedure or the patient. I think it's just, it's a term that got used to like lump in all low RVU procedures or things that folks don't want to do in the hospital that don't necessarily need image guidance. I think someone who wants to criticize that word will say, these are important patients. You shouldn't call them trash. No one's ever done that. Patients are all very important. However, Patients need IVs. Those are very important procedures. They need Foley's. They need their bed cleaned. They need to be fed. 
But a lot of these scenes can be done by other people. The pathoracetesis and paracentesis used to be done at the bedside. Now all of a sudden, you know, IR has to do it. I saw one, somebody wrote that they get this great pleasure at doing a paracentesis and having the patient say that they didn't even feel it. And that makes them so happy. But I would venture to say that physician is probably not having to earn their way. And they're probably paid for by an academic institution or by a radiology group. And most specialists have a sense of what they're doing. They want to do things they're trained for and things that also pay well. And so, you know, you don't see heart surgeons doing their thoracentesis because they want to make sure the patient has a good experience. Of course, you want to have the patient have a good experience, but a lot, you don't need to be a hotshot heart transplant surgeon to do that. And you don't need to be a heart shot IR to do a lot of these low level procedures. But basically, they're medical student level procedures. This is what I see trash IR. Medical student level procedures that tons of people could do that don't pay very well. Why is the IR doing that? Really, IRs, in my mind, should have an office, do consulting with the patients that we love and develop high-end procedures that other people can't do. And that, it turns out, also pay well. So, you know, embolization procedures, PAD, maybe venous insufficiency, chemoembolization, plantable spine stimulators, things like that. Those are all things that I think people should focus on. But your average group, so now, first of all, I want to say there's some great radiology groups out there with some good IRs, but I can tell you down in Florida, there's almost no radiology group that has an office and sees patients. And they're basically reading films, doing low-level procedures, occasionally finding an unopened ketchup packet in their, in the trash bin of a good case. They're not changing their destiny. So this has nothing to do with uh, patients are wonderful. They need to be helped, but the IRs don't need to be doing these low level things. So I have a, another example, a real life example that I want to make sure I tell you about here because this involves your neck of the woods. So because a lot of these private equity purchases of radiology groups, they're fo real focused on RVUs. And so what was already a miserable existence is now even more requirement to read more films. And so the dominant 350 member radiology group in your neck of the woods in Seattle, this is what they're offering their IRs now. They get to film read two out of five days and do IR three out of five days. Now, it turns out it's a little misleading, those 60% of the days on IR, because of that, you're supposed to read films about 60% of the time. And they've actually, they're installing or have installed reading stations inside the IR area so that they can do that. So it's basically just less patient interaction, less consulting, certainly less office time and more get the procedure done and read films. No, like the, the longitudinal care and consulting is very low priority. So these, this is a formula to do low level IR procedures, which is what Kavi called, you know, trash collection. So it's not an insult, it's not an insult to the patients or to the procedure, it's just, it's low level, boring, uninteresting things that no one, no medical student would ever go into IR to do if they knew really what their future held. And I think you like, you really uh, hit the nail on the head a little bit with that is that you we're training all of these really, really bright medical students and residents and fellows in high-end procedures, high-end cases. They want to be able to do that stuff when they're out in practice, but they just aren't enough opportunities for the number of trainees that we put out for everybody to have not even just a 100% IR job, but a job where you might be reading some diagnostic, but you're still doing enough IR to keep your skills up. You know, if people want to join a radiology group and practice IR that way, that's fine. I don't have anything against it. But my big issue is they shouldn't block folks who are trying to practice a different way, practice the way that the SIR has been recommending for decades and maybe they won't be able to make a go of it, but at least they can try their dream and, and that may be very well what they want to do. I do have one final thought of how people can go about it, getting on staff. And, and this is actually also just yesterday I spoke to a person on the East Coast who's in a group that was sold and it's having some of the struggles that I talked about. A whole 40% of the revenue now goes out to pay the company that bought them and they're just having to do more and more volume, more and more call. And so overhead to pay the tax to the king that they promised from the firm that bought that revenue stream. So going to a rural hospital 
that has no IR coverage, maybe no vascular coverage is an opportunity. So you can go to those hospitals and the radiology group doesn't even have an IR. Right now, if there's an IR procedure or vascular procedure, they just get sent out to some place 50 or 100 miles away. So an IR could potentially go there and talk to the CEO to get on staff, maybe to be employed. Maybe you cover two little hospitals, but you could probably negotiate getting a office. A lot of times hospitals will have space where multiple doctors use that particular space, oftentimes the employed doctors. And so that's an opportunity for you to start a clinical practice and, you know, get your foot in the door where you'll be welcomed by everyone. And then maybe down the road, if you develop your practice, you might be able to open an OBL to complement it. That would be a, a wonderful practice, but it's a lot harder to do in the cities where there's established groups. Well, thanks for that overview of multiple different paths to get privileges. You mentioned that you've developed a list of action items for the SIR. You want to go through that list with me? Sure. I was thinking that I'll probably post this list on SIR Connect, OEIS Connect, Line Monkey, and we can also post it when this podcast comes out as a link. It's 13 items that I think that the SAR could do to help independent IRs get on staff. And it's frequently come up when um, these discussions come up, they'll say, well, what do you expect the SIR to do? What can they do? Like, there's nothing they can do. I mean, the one thing they have done is they've now written the third version of the position paper, which the ACR now has, which essentially says if procedures are open to other specialists, they should be opened up to independent IRs. And of course, nobody really follows that. But we've, we've now have an entire generation of IRs that have been hurt by this. And essentially, a lot of the membership who are members of radiology groups, they've been either actively involved with blocking people or, or certainly complicit in it. And I think the leaders of the society should say, you know, what kind of folks do we want out there practicing IR? Who's going to be help? Who's going to make IR look good? How are we going to preserve the future of interventional? Is it with these radiology groups that have no office, no longitudinal care that are doing these low level procedures? Or is it folks that really want to do well with an office and they're going to need to make some decisions? So I'll just read through my list here that I'm going to, I'll post this when the podcast comes out. So number one is the SAR should use their bully pulpit at every opportunity to promote clinical practice, especially those like independent practices that are pure clinical practices. Part of that bully pulpit is to be intolerant to the ubiquitous practice of radiology groups blocking independent IRs from getting hospital privileges at facilities that otherwise have an open staff policy for interventional procedures, which is essentially all private practice hospitals in the United States. They should also use the bully pulpit to criticize the practices that don't have a clinical practice which is also almost every practice in the U.S. Number two, identify the states where an OBL can be open without hospital privileges and those that require it. Some residents may want to go straight to those states so they don't have to fight these battles right now. That doesn't seem like that hard of a, a thing to do, to just identify which states don't need hospital privileges, right? Correct. Yeah, it's something you could easily form a committee to figure that out. The SIR can have OBL sessions at the annual meeting, which they have started doing a lot more of already. They can encourage ways that IR residents can spend time in OBLs for clinical training and learn procedures they may not be exposed to, such as PAD and superficial venous insufficiency. So down in South Florida, like a lot of places, the IRs in the hospitals don't do any PAD. And a lot of the folks coming out now haven't even done it, which is kind of shocking to me. But my um, compatriots in OBLs down here who have a clinical practice is still quite busy doing PAD. And, and so I think um, training programs could look for those places and maybe have the uh, residents rotate through there. And that's something that the SIR could help develop. And number five, the SIR could help develop staffing and financial models to supply IR coverage to hospitals. So what I mean right now, it's just a freebie thrown in with the diagnostic contract, whereas other coverage by other specialties like vascular surgery or neurosurgery, you'll get a call pay or you'll get some kind of contractual agreement where you get paid. And so especially now that hospitals are having more and more problems staffing IR and there's going to be a need 
then the SIR could develop some formulas on how how do you decide how much to get paid by the hospital, maybe, and and some literature that you could take to the hospital to help argue and negotiate with them. There could be, the, this is a little embarrassing to <laughs> state this, we could have a how to get on staff lecture at the annual meeting, which <laughs> I don't really want to give, but apparently there's there's an interest in it. Number seven, we need to be honest with the medical students. You will not be treated equally with other, as with other specialties. And there are very few jobs where you can go out and practice clinical IR. And a lot of them, there's a group, some, some don't come to IR to really maybe do that, but a lot of them do. And so it's kind of shocking and it's, it's false salesmanship to have them join our specialty and find that out after they've done all the training. Number eight, there is, should be a change in IR leadership. Currently, there is no independent IR on the executive committee. Has there ever been an independent IR on the executive committee? Yeah, Mary Constantino. There is a private practice counselor. Mary, Jerry Niedzwiecki was the predecessor, a non-voting member, uh, but the year before Mary went on, and, and that's now a voting position, but it's just a private practice counselor. And currently that's with a gentleman who's in a radiology group. So there's really nobody advocating for these aggressive clinical practices, these independent ones. Is there the equivalent of that in vascular surgery society or cardiology societies? Well, Regarding clinical practice, it's a given. No one ever talks about it because if you you wouldn't even be a member of their society, everybody has a clinical practice, and there's a lot. They have they had some OBL committees. A lot of those folks are on our OEIS society membership that we know a lot of them, and so they don't really have a need to. What they need is to have more OBL representation in some of the leadership positions because I think most societies, a lot of times, they have a lot of academic folks. Yeah. Okay. So number. Nine, you could showcase clinical successes, including OBLs and independent IRs at the annual meeting and at some of uh, our literature that's sent out, like the WIRE, examples of successes. Number 10, legal issues, pay for an amicus brief on the legality of the so-called exclusive contract that allows everyone except independent IRs from getting on staff. That would require some money, not a lot from the society, but it would help the cause. And now a couple of the final thoughts, which are more aggressive, it's terminate SIR membership for those IRs who do not have a clinical practice or who block independent IRs from getting on staff at their hospital in direct violation of the SIR guidelines. Now, I understand that's a little aggressive, but what is going on around the country is a majority of the membership are blocking the IRs in direct violation of the recommendations of the society. And so I think that would be a way to change things pretty rapidly. It would certainly be different. Now, do you think that most of the independent IRs who are being blocked are being blocked by fellow IRs? Or do you think a large component it is the DR group? It's a combination. But if you talk over the years when I've talked to the IRs in those groups, they'll come up with all sorts of stories. They'll say, Julian just said he wouldn't take call and we never even had a conversation about it. One of the folks who's at one of MCVI's sister hospitals told me, who's also an MCVI person, but not at the mothership, not at Baptist, they said, well, I'm going to block anybody I can block. So it's the DR group, it's the IR people. There's this sort of cooked in instinct to succeed by blocking. In my mind, and a lot of people's mind, you succeed by doing good work and doing good clinical work, as opposed to, I'm going to block him, 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 him. That's a traditional radiology group mentality. And a lot of the IRs were brought that way. And so those folks, a lot of times, like I said, they're out of business for the good cases. They've not been able to compete with all the specialists who now do a majority of those, a lot of those procedures. And yeah, they think that blocking me is going to get them cases. And I just don't think that's the case. Did we cover everything? I have one more. Okay. Here's one more. Number 13, the final one. Promote the separation of IR from DR, much like radiation oncology has split from radiology. I wrote an article along with Kavi Devolapali that was published in the AJR on that. And we'll have a link at the end of the uh, Backtable podcast there so that people can look at that. So, yeah, I think that's it, right? Those are all your, that's your 13 points of action. All right. 
And um, um, I appreciate how vocal you've been about this. I think I should let the audience know that these are your views. They don't necessarily reflect on Backtable, but we love to have a variety of different voices on so that everybody can kind of understand the landscape a little bit better. And yeah, and I just, I love talking to you, Dr. Julian. Like you have so much fire after so many years. And I feel like you really want what's best for the younger generation of IRs. And you want everyone to be able to practice in a way that helps patients as much as possible. I think everyone knows these are my thoughts. I'm solely responsible for them. But I do think that if you look at any other society, if they knew that the folks who really wanted to do the tremendous work were being blocked, they would go to bat for them. They would file lawsuits. They would be intolerant as opposed to the laissez-faire approach, which our society has taken hands off, waiting for generations to go by to slowly evolve where people can practice the way they want to. I think they need to take a much more aggressive stance. Well, awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to share before we end our episode? I don't think so. Thank you, Allie. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Good luck with your upcoming lectures that you have going on. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter. Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Mandir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 